All right. Shalom and greetings from Jerusalem, the Narki Street Shabbat Bible study. It's a joy to be with you. And our topic today will be from continuing on in Luke, Luke eleven thirty seven through 41. And I've titled this, uh, What Cleanses Purity and Washing or Charity? Luke 11, 37 through 41 in a dining context. So that's, uh, let's pray and uh, dedicate this time to the Lord. Abba Father, we thank you um, so much for the opportunity to dig into your word, to know you more through it, and to have fellowship now here with this uh, communion of saints gathered around the world uh, to dig into your word as well. We thank you for you and we pray that your holy spirit would be present with us and that we would allow you to penetrate into our hearts uh, to cleanse us in true and maybe difficult ways for your glory in yeshua's name amen okay well, I'm Brian or Baruch Kwasnicka, and happy to be sharing on Luke 11:37. When I agreed to this, you know, Gary was twisting my arm, and I was happy to be for it to be twisted, honestly, because it's it's fun to be here. Uh, I agreed because it was the washing hands pericope, you know, this, um, and so I thought, okay, washing hands, yeah, that has to do with walking, and my PhD is on walking, and you know, walking according to the tradition of the elders. But I thought it was, I didn't look closely in, <laughs> at the time. And I didn't, I know the Luke version just doesn't have it, right? There's no walking, there's no tradition of the elders. And I'm like, oh man, you know, this is just a, this past week. <laughs> and so I said, okay, well, I'm stuck, but, you know, I can compare and contrast and it can tie in a little bit to the, the studies I'm doing as far as walking as a theme of conduct. Um, but I've got to do justice to the text as well. So, so we're gonna we're gonna read the text, and I think, and we're gonna compare and contrast with Luke and Mark and, and Matthew a little bit. See, we talk a little bit maybe about the great omission. I think it stopped sharing, but that's okay. Um, and so, so if you turn to Luke eleven thirty-seven, um, let me try that again. Maybe let's read it here. Does it work again? Yeah, okay. Um, text and translation. So here's the NIV. Uh, but maybe someone else could read. Is that okay? If, Shall I do it? 11, okay. uh, Luke 11. Yeah, 37. And as he spoke, a certain Pharisee came, asked him to dine with him. So he went in and sat down to eat. When the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. Then the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and the dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones, did not he who made the outside made the inside also? but rather give alms of such things as you have, then indeed all things are clean to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think that um, that translation was a little different. Um, I'm not sure, which translation were you reading from? Uh, this was a Gideon Bible, uh, yeah. the Gideon's International in Australia. Uh, yeah, it's a Gideon uh, Bible. So you might have heard some things a little different um, <clears throat> between these different translations. And I want to hone in on them a little bit. Mm -hmm. One is the key, I would say, one of the keys is that, is it, was it, were they noticed, noticing, or they're surprised or shocked that Jesus didn't wash before the meal? Or as your version might have said, ceremonially washed, or I think yours is just washed. Um, if we move ahead to this kind of a combination 
of my own with NASB New King James. Um, you can see it's clearly ceremonially washed before the meal and not just washed. So if just washed before the meal, that might be more hygienic, right? But if it's ceremonially washed, we're talking about something else. And the word there is definitely dipped or immersed. So there's a question of whether it's his whole body or whether it's just his hands. So that's a, that's a significant, thing, significant item that we want to come back to. Um, another aspect that I, I heard a little different, right? Um, you can see it in the NIV. I think it is here. I, I conflated this. I don't know if it's NLT or NIV. But um, it says, if Christ has cleaned the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness, you foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside? But give what is inside the dish to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. So this is one interpretive move, um, trying to figure out what that means. If you give what is inside, or is it a cure, give that which is within as charity. So what is it charity you're giving, or is it giving to the poor? Are these synonymous? Is it coming out of the dish? Is it coming out from within you? And then it's clear that the end is, then all things are clean for you. Is this another example, supposedly, of Jesus overturning the Levitical laws, whereby impurity, ritual impurity, doesn't matter? And the short answer is no. <laughs> but, Ron, Ron, I've yes. got, I've got, but give as sadikah, those things that are within, and indeed everything is pure to you. Give those things as tzedakah, as charity. Give, what does the Greek as, say? But give <laughs> things as like, tzedakah, which I assume... You need the Greek, not, the, you yeah. need the Greek, not a bunch of other translations. Yeah, yeah and we're just getting at that. Yeah, you're, okay. you're right, Lois. And so I haven't gone further much in the PowerPoint, but I just wanted to bring the text yeah. here. Right, okay. But so we won't, I'll stop sharing. And... We can talk about uh, the Greek text, for example. It, it's ambiguous. Otherwise, there you know there wouldn't be right any of questions. And so, it says um, in what is it? Let me just look. Um, in I think it's Enanto. Something these inside things. Well, what are the inside things? Is it the platters or is it the things of your body? And so. Uh, this this is the, the question. Um, let me just look a little bit here further. Yeah, you have. Let's go from the top, and we'll get there. So the, the two one of the two key things here is whether um, what is this washing that's going on, and what are these insects? And those two questions will kind of guide us into trying to unpack what's going on here. Um, <clears throat> if you're following in the synopsis, it's Alan uh, number 194. And um, yeah, we have other issues that can, can be talked about as well. Um, but these are the two cruxes, I believe. So what's happening? Um, the first thing for us to, to discuss uh, is this is this issue of um, being washed. Why would someone be shocked or surprised that Yeshua wouldn't wash? And in the other passages, it's parallels. It's his disciples. Here, it's actually Yeshua. Um, why would anybody be shocked that he didn't wash? Any ideas? Well, had if they become part of the oral tradition that, you know, just as the priests were supposed to watch before their temple service, um, mm -hmm. if the, if the um, head of the household is, is priest of his home, then he should be doing the same priestly type of things and um, coming into his home. Right. If you, if you understand it as a ceremonial washing, yeah, if someone 
the Pharisee takes on this level of priestly purity, then the washings from Leviticus are extended in such a way to include even being even washing at home. Um, and if you had been out in the marketplace and you touch something that a Gentile may have touched, couldn't you be bringing unceremony, uncleanliness into your home? It's yeah, so this is a question. There's, and this is, there are so many aspects of Jewish law that are tacitly or part of the system. And if we're not aware of these types of levels of purity, then we're, we can easily misunderstand to the point that some translations, and I, I think it's NLT or NIV, one of them, it's just washings. It's not ceremonial washings. And then so I would expect if I had, didn't had given the key already that ceremonial washing, I would expect some people to say, well, they were shocked that he didn't wash because it's unhygienic. Uh, well, I, well, I think when, when you dip together in the same uh, bowl uh, in, a, in a communal uh, meal, then it's really important that everybody has clean hands. Yeah, so this is this is what you would expect in a in just a general hygienic perspective mm -hmm. of the 21st century or 20th century. It, my translation definitely has ritual washing. Right. But my question is, is ritual hand washing before a meal actually biblically commanded? Definitely not. Oh, and it's not I'm, even it's not even clear where it comes from. Right. Um, I've got my my version's got nitilat yadaim ceremonial washing from the oral law. Yeah, so that is a possible nitilat yadaim is a term used I think from the Mishnah onwards to talk about ritual hand washing, and that might be what's going on here. Um, there's there's a question. Um, we see this in Mark's passage where there's a, a Greek term that talks about a fist level of water. So the water, mm. the amount of water that can go through your fist mm. to, to, uh, to cleanse it. So it's mm. probably that's what's going on. But where did this come from? It's not from, it's not directly from the Bible. Yeah. A friend of ours, um, Yair Fussenberg, has suggested in an article about five, ten years ago, that it's actually Roman custom Mm. Oh. coupled with Levitical law in heightened priestly purity practices that the Pharisees want to emphasize and accommodate to Roman custom that creates this tradition. Oh, interesting. So, so it's not coming from, it's not definitely not coming directly from the Bible. Mm. Um, and, and, and then you, you come to the additional difficulty, not just of the washing of hands, why are you washing hands in this in this time period or, or beginning to wash hands in the time period? It's in order to not convey impurity through the wetness on your hands or the, the through wetness and through perspiration even maybe or through wetness you can transfer impurity as well as be cleansed by by water, right? And so if if you have damp hands or some water comes in contact and you haven't immersed ritually, then you are a conveyor of a second degree impurity. Ooh. What does it mean second degree impurity? Well, it's not a base impurity and there's graded impurity that takes place. This is not in the text, but it's derived from the biblical text, right? And so without an understanding that in Jesus's time, there was a beginning, we don't know exactly when, but of graded purity whereby one could touch the outside of a cup and it may convey the impurity to that cup then there seems to be a debate whether you know you have to just clean the outside of the cup or dip the whole cup and the mishnaic uh, and Pharisaic perspective seems to be that you've got to dip the whole cup. So it kind of renders Jesus's critique a little odd. Anyway, odd to say that. Is, is there a reference here to John 13, 10? Is there a reference here to John 13, is John 13, 10? When Jesus says a person who's had a bath and he's only washed his feet, his whole body is clean. 
Yeah, yeah it could well, be referring to that in a way, a similar kind of way, but we have, we do have installations that have been discovered all over Judea, especially and a little bit in the Galilee, and even in homes where there's a little cupped out area at the entrance to doors where you could wash feet, it seems. Oh. One, one, other people argue that you would, you would pour water over and it would drip down in this and then you could use it for feet. So you see these little um, dip, uh, cupped, cupped kind of depressions inside doors, and this could be what's going on. But it's really kind of hard to imagine that, okay, this is the general context that's going on in Jesus' time, but is this what's referring to Luke chapter 7, uh, Luke chapter 11, 37 through 41? Not as much, it seems. Uh, it's probably kind of some kind of immersion in you know, like in, uh, I guess, the old, the old movies are back in the 30s or 20s, before rain water, you'd have a, a, a little bucket of water you'd dip your hands in or something, something like this. Or if you, if you pair it with Mark 7, where you have just enough water to pour over your fist and it becomes clean. Something like this is going on. But the key is, is that in this time, there's graded levels of impurity. The base level of impurity is the, 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 the ones that are biblical. Right, like corpse impurity, right? Mm -hmm. So if you touch a corpse, or if if you even walk over a corpse, or that you are contracting impurity, it's interesting that just a few verses later in Luke uh, <laughs> eleven forty four, you he has this is not our passage, so we're not going to spend much time on it, right? But woe to you, um, more more Pharisees, for you are like graves that are not seen, and men walk over them without knowing them. So this is suggesting that Jesus is buying into the Pharisaic understanding that walking over a grave in a graveyard in a Pharisaic understanding is, conveys impurity. Um, so, so graves and bones are one of the fathers of impurity, but there's other levels of impurity. So if you have sexual relations, right, this is, you become ritually impure. It's not a sin. We all remember it's not a sin, right, because God commanded um, sex. Uh, but if you don't deal with impurity over time, then it becomes uh, wrong. And and so then if you went to the marketplace after you had sexual relations and you went to the marketplace, didn't go to immerse and you were selling cucumbers, right? Then the cucumbers could convey in a sense uh, through some sweat or water, right? Convey them onto the cucumbers and then certain understandings seem to suggest the cucumbers become impure and then so this is what's going on more in mark seven we're not gonna so, but i'm so tempted to <laughs> lean that way because there's a fuller context luke has such a telescoped uh text here but mark's context that seems to be very clear what's going on the point is is that there's graded impurity three levels of, of primary secondary tertiary uh, impurity and that is the context of what's going on, even to be begin to think of um, washing of hands, pots, inside, outside, and things like this. We don't have a full understanding. It's a very, very vexed situation. We don't have enough information. I, I mean, we have incredibly gifted top scholars at Hebrew University, right? Like I just mentioned, Nader Furstenberg now, coming up with, like, pulling out their heads to try to figure out where this hand washing is coming from. And, um, but Brian, uh, the one thing we do have to be clear about, we're talking yeah. about ceremonial washing and ceremonial cleansing, right. which is not linked to mm, hygienic morality. Not morality is really more right. important. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah, I was just, I was going to uh, note in my Bible, mm -hmm. um, I have an NIV study Bible, and it says, that the ceremony, it's not commanded in the law, which we've already decided, but it was added in the tradition of the Pharisees. Now, is that true? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely That's later on, saying. for sure. And it's just a question of when and how is it okay. it's already in Jesus's time that this is happening. Yeah, right. Lois? Question. Um, and maybe you'll do this, talk about this at another point, but um, to me, uh, this passage 
the, it seems so strongly related. Well, it's a, a different uh, telling of um, uh, what is in Matthew 15, or let's see, or uh, um, hear and understand, is it not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Um, well, or it somehow it seems like you're talking about what's inside versus what outside uh, defiling, and I, I wonder if it's related to that saying. I have to. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was just interesting, is that they um, that there's something going on there. Just uh, can you? Yeah. Were you going to comment on that at some point, or Not maybe so much? But I, I would say that the Matthew passage, I think, is more speaking. I mean, it's similar and different, right? It's more about words. Yeah, right. And it's more about that right. rather than tangible yeah. charity in alms. Yeah, right, right. right. So, oh. so the Matthean passage, I think, is more, let's just look at what, what verse is it here? 15.10. Yeah, and it's not even, look at that. Um, in the Allen version, it's, it's not, I have to go over to the other um just a moment okay uh, one, yeah here it is okay so um yeah so it's it all it's it's mainly it's just about the mouth right in yep. Matthew 15 10 it's only about the mouth Mm -hmm. Tell the people and said, "Hear and understand." Not, not goes up south. What the? Yeah. So there's nothing, nothing further to explain that. Right. And it's so true. it's it's more about what is said. Yeah. And the right. words. Whereas right. in Luke, it's not. It is what's coming out of the person that mm -hmm. that defiles or cleanses. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Here it's talking about defiling. In Luke, there's something that's coming out of a person. I'm going to argue it's not it's not a dish like the NIV says. That's uh, I mm. think what we notice. Well, last, wrong, but the, the it's coming out of the run. person, and mm -hmm. there's something that's coming out of the person mm -hmm. that is cleansing them. Oh, cleansing! Interesting. Cleansing Ooh. and not defiling. wow, interesting. So, and this is a theme in Luke, and it's going to be a radical theme. That's going to challenge all of us, including myself, <laughs> as we progress through yeah. this study. I think some of us are going to like it more than others, but, and that's okay. We're, we can all wrestle it. It's the word of the Lord, and we're trying to understand it for life. Amen? Yeah. Yes. Amen. So, so, uh, so let's back to uh, the Luke and, Luke and passage here. So, so um, just a question about coming out of the person. Yeah. When I think of it physically... Normally, the exits of a body of a person are not the mouth, just for the words, but the fluids of the body are coming from another part of the body and are yeah. really uh, unclean. Yeah, so, well... And well, actually not. No, 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 actually, that's not... Those aren't unclean. <laughs> yeah, they're <laughs> unclean mean, in a hygienic way, but in a, in a legal... They're not considered unclean. Right. Sorry, I'm inter interrupting. No, that's sorry. right. No, yeah, so that's exactly... That's, now, now, Rich, you're leaning to the Mark 7, right, passage, which definitely, so we're very tempted to go to those parallels. Right. And, but, yeah. and, and yeah. especially Mark 7, because it's got so much more context and right. it's rich in it. And it talks yeah. about, yeah, something goes out of a person and it's rendered um, null and void. I mean, it's just, it's a non-issue, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, but it doesn't render, you know, even if you eat a pig, you're not unclean. It's just wrong, right? <laughs> uh, it's interesting. You can do it. Right. It's a uh, detest. Well, okay, yeah. Sorry, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not condemning anybody. We, anybody can eat pig if they want, right? If, you know, as the Lord directs them. Unless the, the, but, unless but the Lord in Jewish can. context, if you eat a pig, it yeah. doesn't cause you to be richly unclean until today in ancient times. It's just wrong. Uh, whereas there are other things that do cause you. To become unclean like corpse impurity and there's also eight kinds of vermin uh in leviticus but there's just eight kinds right it's not every, every kind so so there's different we have to 
the hygienic unclean is not equal to the ceremonial unclean, in a sense, if we think that. Okay, so but, um, say Brian, you, yeah. you you wanted to make the point that the the. Wait, okay, Danny, did are you still there? Brian, can I just point out that last week we looked at basically a good Ein, uh, Ein Tov and Ein Ra, and Ein the whole thing about the, 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 the Ein Ra was basically, it was linked with greed and minginess and so on. Okay. And it didn't seem to be an accident that we go on now. No. And that you're saying inside you're full of greed and wickedness. No, no, no. Yeah, and so maybe I should back up just a little bit. Um, and the, I did have a part in my notes here that was just going to give context. And so this right. is a segue into that. What, what is the context of this whole passage? I, was, I, I had uh, two or three different, um, two different elements of the context, right? So following along um, in, in the flow of Luke chapter 11, right before that, like you said, it's, it's all about um, generosity. I mean, you talked about it last week, right? Did I? And so it's about money. It's about um, giving and charity. Yep. And we see that even prior to that. So if we look back in 11, um, verse 13, God is such a good God. He's not going to be evil like us. He's going to give good gifts to his children. Or if we back up further. He's not going to be He's not going to be stingy. He's not going to be stingy. He's going to be lavishly giving, right? And we back up further, you know. Um, sorry, no, not further. So, so, so that's so just eleven thirteen, a little bit of eleven verse eight. I give him as much as he needs. This persistence. We do have an element of the Lord's prayer, which is a little bit more giving minded, right? What verse four eleven four? For we ourselves, we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. So we have this idea of giving, indent, being indebted, and such uh, different than, than Matthew's. So we have the aspect of giving, of doing, of being generous in, in chapter 11, verse 27, 28. Jesus rails against the idea that it's lineage he follows the Pharisaic tradition of it's not about lineage. It's a, as much as it's about doing. It's about giving or, you know, it's about observing. It's the Shema, verse 28. On the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word and observe it. Um, then we have uh, the eye of is being good, 1134. And then we have this seemingly unrelated passage that takes place where? We'll get to that in a moment. That's very interesting too. And there's one more little bit in, in our passage that we read that also relates to this giving, stinginess, wickedness that re relates to money. Does anybody see that in, in our passage? It's in verse 39, <laughs> or 40, sorry, 40. He rebukes the Pharisees. Um, that let's see so you what are they full of they're full of greed and wickedness greed or robbery so they're taking rather than giving right right and so you actually have quite a theme building up here of of this mm -hmm. giving that is what god expects because that's he who he is and giving demanded and re re requested by by his disciples right and so this is uh, i think a theme that we're going to see uh, throughout so i want to go back a little bit to where this takes place where is is he in the galley or or is he somewhere else any, idea, any ideas it's not that's okay um, At first blush, I mean, I kind of hadn't thought too too deeply about this, and, and I I thought, well, it says that the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem in Matthew in the parallel in Matthew fifteen one, right? Okay. And 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 
and Mark he seven one two. He hasn't shifted thing. place since he was in in with with Martha and Miriam at the end of ten, and they're in um, they're near Jerusalem. That's right. That's what as far me as I too. can see, he's not moved. So so it it's interesting. I I I was influenced by David Biven, you know, and and he he highlights that whenever you have somebody coming from Jerusalem and connecting with somebody in the Galilee, the tension rises. That's how I remember it anyway. So I kind of associated this with the Galilee. But you're right, uh, you know, Gemma, that the last context there is actually, it doesn't specify in Luke's passage, does it? I don't think, but in the parallels that Martha and Mary's house is where? Bethany. Bethany, right? And, well, okay, Bethany just opens up a whole host of associations, right? With Beit Ani, Beit Oni, you know, Dead Sea Scrolls and Copper Scroll saying that there's a leper colony three kilometers outside of Jerusalem to the east, right? And so, and, and you know, Simon the leper and the Pharisee, all, all of a sudden, you know, it's not a priestly home. It's not a, it's not a Pharisaic home. It's like an outcast home, right? House of the of the outcasts, the house of the poor and oppressed. It's a quarantine hotel. It's a quarantine hotel. Yeah, so so Jesus is hanging out with the quarantine people or something, and maybe others who don't have prime real estate in Jerusalem, right? Because they're on the back slope of the Mount of Olives. At this point, it's that's a far out. Now it's pretty, you know, pretty well, pretty good real estate. But um, and so so that context is interesting to think about. Um, I mean, we could go off on a rabbit trail too far, but just to remember, that's where he ascended from. I mean, that is such an amazingly powerful fact that he did not ascend from the heights of Mount of Olives, but from the backside of the Mount of Olives, Beit Ani, and, and hanging out with these type of people. And then Philippians chapter 2, if you humble yourselves, he'll lift you up. I mean, the riches there of preaching and, and meditating upon that are enough for, for us for forever. I mean, in some ways, I mean, just so it's so rich to think about that. So if this is the, if this is the area in which this is um, taking place, that adds a little twist, a little bit more meaning uh, to, to what we're thinking about. There's, this is in close proximity to the you know, the Pharisees of, from Jerusalem are coming uh, out to this quarantine area, right? Um, or somewhere in between. It's not very far from Jerusalem, but it's still outside of Jerusalem, enough to have another little name, Bethany, right? Beth Page, uh, in between the two. Uh, actually, you know, Bethany, Beth Page is in between Bethany and the top of the Mount of Olives. Um, so what what else do we have the context here? Uh, so it's I'm I'm I think and I haven't researched it fully, but I think that this is probably the area in which is he's giving uh, this lesson about alms, which is also interesting. It's you know coming to, close to the temple, that right? people are going to be giving alms and bringing up alms, and so there's so many different aspects if, if we isolate it to that location. But the broader location is, um, is, is the Galilee teaching, and there's discourses just before this. In the Matthew and Mark passage, the last thing we have before Matthew and Mark, what is it? It's not, it's not uh, Mary and Martha, right? So this, this has to be held in tension. This, 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 the Matthew and Mark passages kind of push it a little bit more into the Galilee. Can you give us a, can you give us a chapter? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, um, so it's uh, Mark uh, 6, the end of Mark 6, and the end of Mark 14, right? So the, the, the we're parallels, talking about Matthew, Matthew just now. The, our parallels are found in Matthew 15 and Mark 7. So you just back up a little bit into Mark 6 and Matthew 14. And what are those, what are those passages about? Or where, where do we have geographical data there very clearly? Uh, so three of Philippi is in Matthew. Yeah, and a little bit later though, at the end of fourteen, at the end of fourteen, if we're, if we're, we'll go to Matthew fourteen first, I guess. 
Um, they, were the, they came to land at Gennesaret. Uh, yeah. So we have a very clear designation just near at the end of, very end, I think, right? Very end of 14 is yeah. he, that he lands at. Exactly. So that's our last geographical designation before we come into our pericopes, more or less, right? Uh, our teaching and that we're focusing on now. And, and the same thing is in Mark. Maybe we don't have to turn there, but, but um, I mean, we can. Mark, Mark 6, just to, just to verify this. And these, that uh, Mark also has the same Gennesaret um, connection, right? And, you know, Gennesaret is the Greek ver version of Kineret, Gennesar today. And, uh, and so this is just right before the healing, except that it says that whenever Jesus went, this is now Mark, um, Mark, five, Mark 6, 56, whenever he entered villages or cities or countryside, they were laying the sick in the marketplaces and imploring him that they might just touch the, what? Touch the, yeah, the fringe, or the tassels of his cloak, and as many as touched it were being cured. So our last geographical ref reference in Matthew and Mark is Gennesaret. This is where the healing of the, of the, the bleeding woman and then we have this, wherever he goes throughout the Galilee, however many people touched his tassels, which is not the edge of his cloak, right? It's a, it's a Jewish embroidered uh, element. And uh, that's another, that's one, that's one of the most succinct, I would say, and whistle-blowing articles that David Biven has written in the NIV Jesus, right? So if you want to read a little nice <laughs> nail it he nailed it i mean it's just for a new international version of jesus he he is one of the few that woke up people to the fact and now it's becoming more aware that, that there were tassels not just edge the, okay the point is it's, it's gennesaret and it's the very pharisaic context jesus is wearing tassels and but it, yet he has um pharisees who were going after him right and it's noteworthy that it doesn't have to be an unbeliever necessarily right in him uh he could be interested we have a number of pharisees that are very positive and pharisees that are following him and and later on of course paul and nicodemus right so so uh, it's just a certain a certain a piece in greek a certain pharisee that uh, comes up we don't know the context there but uh that's the Galilean or Bethany Pharisaic context. In, 15, in Matthew 15, 1, it's very right. clear that these Pharisees and Torah scholars came to Yeshua from Jerusalem. So that's, right. that's spelled out in simple words. That's right. So both Mark and Matthew say that, basically. So I always, I've been, I spent a lot of time in Mark 7. And so I just gra gravitate to the Galilean context. But in Luke, you've got Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha and Lazarus are from Bethany, right? And so it may put it in a Bethany context. And it, it says they came from Jerusalem, but it doesn't say how far they walked, right? Did they, did they walk from Jerusalem to Bethany, or did they walk from Jerusalem to the Galilee, right? And so we just don't know. I think is, there have, anything, is there anything known about uh, Pharisees going to and fro from Jerusalem to Galilee? Uh, yeah, I know that we have, um, there's a wonderful article by Shmuel Safrai that talks about the Galilean nature of uh, the Jewish nature of the Galilee and how there's a tension between the leaders or the people from Judea going to the Galilee and they they criticize each other. We also have Gamliel mentioned in the Talmud as sending out uh, letters, uh, Pharisaic letters, uh, I believe to the Galilee, um, as well as to the diaspora. So some... some so um, when, yeah. when, when the gospel explicitly says uh, Pharisees from Jerusalem, that's Ooh. something uh, noticeable. I so, think so maybe they differ from the Pharisees, which were uh, right. were present at Galilee. I agree. I, I definitely agree. Yeah, Lois, you had, I, I, I think well, you're right on Richard. And, yes, 
I just remember from that same uh, Sephry article, he was talking about the um, Galilee was actually the source that uh, their standards, purity standards were high enough that their the wares, the things that they produced were used in the temple. And so there was a, uh, they, surprisingly, as far away as they were, there was this transport between the Galilee and Jerusalem for things ritually pure for um, temple use. I remember that. And so it, it suggests there's probably people there checking the purity, uh, I, I would imagine, and that's a concern to Pharisees. And that that article, if anybody wants to follow up on it, is really nice yeah. and free online on Emmanuel, yeah. the Emmanuel Journal, spelled with an I, on the Ecumenical Research Fraternity in Israel. They have the whole back. It's a very long article, but it's a great article. So yeah. comprehensive. All of that is free online. So Shmuel Safray, the, the Jewish nature of the Galilee, the Galilean nature. Of we're, to we're told specifically that the Pharisees came, went from Jerusalem. Therefore, surely, it doesn't matter where they came from, the implication here is the Pharisee invited Jesus to his, his, his home, which is where then Jesus then challenges the legalistic tradition. Yes, yes. Yeah, and so, you know, it's interesting to think, you know, we do have a known, a certain, interesting, <laughs> A cert, we do have a known Pharisee from Bethany. Who is that? Ooh. You you know it. I, 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 uh, it 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 it's uh, Simon. All right. Um, we have he's known as the Pharisee, and he's known as uh, the, the leper in the two accounts. Um, and so we have Mary, Martha. Lazarus and Simon the leper, the Pharisee from Bethany. So we have four people there all from that place. So I have never thought of it before actually, but could that be Simon? I have to think through the logic of that, whether that's the case. But the point is, is that um, we have a Pharisee that's associated with Bethany, whether he was healed as a form, in a form, no one as a leper or he was an ongoing leper. It's hard to imagine that he was a leper inviting Yeshua in as a Pharisee in Bethany. So I imagine he's a former leper, but we don't know. Hey, Brian, so, you, you, I just wanted to see if I can um, sum this up correctly in, in what you're saying that, yeah. you know, that basically, you know, the typical Christian interpretation of this passage and these, these types of passages are that, that Jesus is rallying against the law, fulfillment of the law, not, not just like ceremonial or, you know, or anything like this. And that, um, and and that you know that that you you know you're that that's not where you get that's not what you know makes you pure right mm -hmm. um and and obviously anybody who watches this bible study knows that that's not you know what um is is going on here um but he he does seem to be in the vein of isaiah to be saying that you know god what god you know of course um, you know, just like when Isaiah says, you know, he doesn't want to hear your praises. Um, he wants to see justice. It's not that God doesn't like praising or, or worshiping. Obviously he just, he, he, he wants the, he wants the precedence. He wants the, he wants the, the, you know, the core of what really consumed you to be righteous living. Right. And so then that obviously, is, and it's, there's obviously no negation there of, of, of any of the fulfillment of the law, be it, be it moral or uh, ceremonial. Um, but what's, what's a further misinterpretation is that, you know, I think if you ask without looking at this passage just directly, but if you just sort of like stop at your kind of average Christian on the street and say, so what would Jesus say is the way that you become pure from the inside, right? That's they will all immediately say, oh, well, that's you, you, you know, you, your sins are washed out right through forgiveness and mm -hmm. or you're you are um the whole holy spirit comes in you and then you just you get this you 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 get possessed and you get it just it just cleans you out because you have you have accepted cleanliness God, jesus mm -hmm. offers it and you accept it and you're clean mm -hmm. but 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 that's a yet another further misreading because jesus is saying what is it that does it mm -hmm. it's your righteous living it's Ooh. your righteous acts <gasps> it's your it's well, the and that purify that purifies you. That's that's what brings cleanliness. So that I mean that that's that's kind of like the the the, 
slammer on the head of of almost of ninety nine percent of you jokers. What they think? You ask them, they will. No, no one goes there. No one right. says, "Oh, That's this is because it's only a little bit longer." But, but yes, we and we in this community right now, and maybe those Jesus in saying that the faith. is so important but a cleansing almost to take place before and there's another stage that we have maybe missed i'm getting to kind of the punchline stage they have missed by not understanding the jewish context that faith and atonement Yeshua, and that is that is a major theme in, in Luke. And wouldn't you say that it's not just a stage, but it's the Ooh, holy cow? I don't know. I I, I want to <laughs> keep Yeshua Bruh. way up there, right in his blood. <laughs> but I want to also recognize that there are are elements that yeah. It's so important to grapple. I would. Say, I think it's important to highlight for any of our um, listeners who are like, "Oh no," that we are, are grappling honestly with the very words of Jesus, and and so that's the, the ultimate. You cannot ignore the very words of Jesus when we are getting into some of these things where you're like, "Wait, what?" Let, let, let us, let Lois, us before you go on, can we please, Brian, I want you to repeat word for word what you okay, just well, said. I'm going to do that, I'm gonna do that in 10 minutes. No, I want you to do it before no, you go on. You're not oh. in charge, Gemma. Uh, okay, just, just okay, <laughs> let's, let's keep going. I want, I want to highlight one more context. We, we talked about the geographical context. We didn't talk enough about the Pharisaic context, just how three mm. times in Luke, we have, we have Jesus dining and eating with a Pharisee. Luke 7.36. 11, 14, Luke 14, 1, and, 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 um, and then we have uh, this context of, of uh, Luke 6, 11, um, that I want to, I want to tie in very briefly because it captures more accurately Luke's perspective on the Pharisees. And, and this is based upon the, the really incredible work. It's not for the lighthearted, but I want to, uh, mention it. Isaac Oliver, Torah Praxis af after 70 wow. CE. I think I've read it twice. I don't like the redaction criticism here, but I love the interpretation. And I think he's one of the more important voices in New Testament scholarship, Torah Praxis after 70 CE. And he, he challenges the, the interpretation of Luke 6 11, this Pharisaic context that I want to kind of broadly speak about before we move on. And that the correct translation of Luke 6, 11 says, and they were filled with want of understanding mm. and discussed with one another what they might do mm. with Jesus. Mm. And this is, this, is, this is not a typical translation and it's greatly, mis, mis, how do you, uh, speaks badly of the Pharisees in most translations, but it's not a good translation. So I wanna just show the Pharisee context of dining of how the Pharisees are actually close. They warn Jesus, right? And so he is one of them in a sense. Um, yeah, and we won't go further on that. Mm -hmm. We've already talked about the Tanakh background of purity, impurity enough. I wish we had time to, to look a little more at 11, Leviticus 11 and have a quote from Boyar in, in the Jewish Gospels. Um, let me Let me... Let me do this real quickly. One half a quote. One of the biggest obstacles to this understanding has been in the U English use of clean and unclean mm. to refer both the laws of permitted and forbidden foods as well as the laws of pollution and impurity 
and purity. These translate two entirely different sets of Hebrew words, mutar versus tahor, and it'd be better to translate the first by permitted and forbidden, and the use of clean and unclean, or impure and impure. So that, this, this has caused a lot of confusion. So th those are some backgrounds. We've, yeah, we've mentioned um, Pustenberg already. We've talked about ceremonial washings. Let's get to the juggler now that Danny is like leaning into uh, nicely. And, uh, and, and we see uh, in verse, let's read now verse, again, let's reread now verse 39 uh, through 41. But the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, a little different than Matthew 21, but, but inside you, plural, are full of greed, more even better than robbery, greed, arpage, and wickedness. You foolish ones did not he who made and this is a key phrase in Luke that again and again and again gets used for the maker, the one who creates, right? So we're talking about a, a God who creates. He has made you both out and in. The outside make the inside. So he's switching from the platter and cup to the person. But give that which is within as charity and and then all things are clean for you so basically this follows along um a theme within luke that hammers against the pharisees who love money this is luke 16 14 it it highlights the maker in acts 17 26 and 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 acts 4 24 of the one who makes heaven and earth, right? He has made you. We have this awesome image of the maker, again in Luke 1, 49. And, and so, so Jesus just kind of turns this and transfers this from, from ritual impurity to moral impurity and puts it back on them in this creation context that you are, you know, in the image of God. And, and uh, so then we have this, the juggler now that's coming, that this passage that says things will be clean for you if you're willing to give charity, alms, tzedakah, give from within yourself, is paralleled in other passages. And we see this later on in Cornelius, who's like the hero right, in Acts chapter 10, we see this confirmed in Acts chapter 11, and then we see it even in Acts 15, 9, and, I, and I'd encourage us to turn this, because there's no better way to interpret scripture than let scripture interpret scripture, right, so Acts 15, 9 really should translate as making no distinction between us and them. This, remember the context, Acts 15 is the apostolic decree, right? And they're trying to figure out how Gentiles and Jews relate. And, and so Acts 59 says, making no distinction between us and them after cleansing their hearts. Oh, well, I'm reading the bad translation first. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't see, shouldn't be making no distinction between us and them after cleansing their hearts by faith but rather making, here's the correct transition, making no distinction between our faith and theirs on account of having cleansed their hearts. Cleansing, then, in this verse, is understood in relation to Cornelius. And how is it done? We, go, we look back to the words of Jesus. Cleansing, and the, the pure, clean, ritually pure, I mean, uh, morally pure, purity is coming through Tzedakah, charity, and alms. And so now to come back, uh, get Gemma, to, to, to something of a rephrasing of what you wanted me to quote. I am seeing through these passages in Luke, especially in Luke thir uh, 11, 
41, 42, and Acts 15, 9, and the example of Cornelius, and the emphasis on alms, that there is a key aspect of giving from our heart in a tangible way, not just some, right, and of alms and almsgiving and charity that is redemptive. And that is, that cleanses us in order to receive the gift of faith. And so the atonement comes still through the, the blood of Yeshua, but a cleansing that takes place in order to receive that faith uh, happens through our tangible giving. And this is, this is not something that I'm so comfortable with, and I, I, I state it gently, but it has a rich tradition that has been picked up by a number of people, both Protestants and Catholics, in recent years, and that has been championed uh, greatly uh, by people like Gary Anderson, coming from a Catholic perspective on charity, the place of the poor in the Bible tradition, but also uh, people like um, David Downs, alms and charity and reward and atonement in early Christianity, Baylor University, 2016. And he has an amazing quote from, from uh, St. Basil, um, coming from uh, the Cappadocia region. He says the following, Seize, therefore, and fulfill the commandment, the commandment to show pity on the hungry as you would take hold of a fugitive, securing it from all sides with grasping hands and encircling arms. Give a little and gain much. Destroy the original sin by freely distributing food. For as sin came through Adam's evil act of eating, so we ourselves blot out our treacherous consumption if we remedy the need and hunger of a brother. St. Basil. Amazing, right? And so how, how, is that, how is that original sin, isn't that powerful, of eating an apple, right, and consumption of food, how are we cleansed from that sin? In a way, there's a, there's a preliminary stage that, that does it, physically, and then is received spiritually uh, from Yeshua, I believe. I, but this is, uh, this is I'm sure, going to cause some, some discussion. <laughs> I, I see in, in, in this whole uh, story a strong parallel with the baptism of Jesus, the total immersion in water, being cleansed to fulfill all righteousness, as a start of his ministry, but also as a start of a Christian life. You have a total immersion, a total cleansing as a start, and then to continue the way you just described, to do righteousness, and by doing righteousness, uh, yeah, staying righteous, but the start is the immersion, like the cup in water, it's the baptism of Jesus and of, of a Christian uh, person. And I think... I think we have to put this in the context of the first century, too, where when Jews and Christians are wrestling of, over who can be part of the people of God, right? right? Mm -hmm. And we've got Jews who are saying, you've got to be circumcised. Luke, uh, the beginning of Acts 15, which I didn't quote, right? A Pharisee, Jew, uh, a Jewish Pharisee and a believer in Jesus says you've got to be circumcised to be saved, mm -hmm. right? And so they're wrestling over who can be part of the... Uh, so, so Gentiles remain Gentiles, Mm -hmm. And are cleansed as Cornelius through his almsgiving yeah. and his prayers that went up to heaven, right? And 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 uh, does that mean he's saved from that by that? I don't I don't think so. But it, it's a preparatory step or something. It's a very significant part. And if we take out that step, we're maybe claiming oh boy, <laughs> the blood without. But without how do actions, you solve the right? tension? And yeah. so we have to be very careful that we are not, if we are not cleansed mm. through the righteous acts that mm. God has commanded, mm. that we cannot receive well the gift of faith. We're not how, how do you connect that with uh, being saved by grace, which is Christian theology? 
Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're saved by we're standard saved by grace. Christian theology. Yeah, we're, we're definitely saved by grace. I mean, we are all sinners, right? We need grace is actually such a rich concept in the Tanakh and the New Testament, right? And it and it exudes. There is, you know, giving of alms doesn't isn't ungraceful. It's following the most graceful person in the world. We just saw, read that the Creator God is giving His children good gifts, and we want to be like Him, right? And so we are modeling the Creator. Uh, Lois, you had something. Um. Well, um. Say, I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to give you a pushback, but then I'm going to say why I'm not going to, and then I'll disagree with my own self. But. Okay. Um, uh, I believe there is this scholar who wrote about that one of the, the big crimes of the temple priesthood was that they were not giving alms of their own, you know, uh, that uh, Jesus was particularly angry at the priesthood for not giving alms to the poor. They were not tithing from their own, right? right? And, and then we just hear about the Pharisees have a particular problem with greed. And so I was sitting there thinking, you know, maybe he's level, he's level, he's at the Pharisees home and he's leveling this sermon straight at their problem, that it isn't just a blanket, um, you know, statement about uh, if you give money, you'll get uh, saved that that was but then you just said right. Corne, you point out Cornelius that he is giving alms and so I can see exactly where I uh, but I just took, I don't I just think that, that alms giving saves no yes right, right. that's but not I mean, quite why I'm saying that but right mm -hmm. so no but I think you're right to bring it back to the the tangible situation mm -hmm. and right. here he is in in a Pharisee's home um maybe in Bethany area, right? And they might be critical of, of the, the extortion, I mean, the, how the, the priests were extorting the people mm -hmm. even more mm -hmm. than these wicked Pharisees or something, right? Yes? Right. And uh, so, no, your point is well taken. But I, I think you can, I think we can have the affirmation to give alms as a cleansing part that is coupled with saving faith. Yeah. So what about the rich young ruler in Matthew 19? When he talks about he comes to Jesus and he says, what can I do to inherit eternal life? He said, I've done all the good things. What does Jesus say? He said, I want, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions. Give to the poor and you'll have treasures in heaven. Follow me. And, yeah, wow. nice Great. parallel with the rich young ruler thank you mom yeah. i think i think like there's a ju juxtaposition here maybe of of um kind of formula versus principle and mm -hmm. ironically like what's happened with modern christian interpretation is that you know they say you know, oh, you know, these stupid Pharisees or these stupid Jews or the stupid Old Testament even is what they're actually saying is that, you know, what idiots to think that they could they could follow this formula of things to do and that gets them salvation. Right. And and but they've just created their own formula that says if you if you just you say the sinner's prayer and you just you you know, you say a few words and then this thing comes over you like a cloud and then you're saved. Also very formulaic, right? Whereas Jesus is saying both of the Pharisees, and then we weren't around yet. Evangelicals weren't around yet to, for him to criticize, but he might say to you know us too on the other side that you know, no, you idiots. Like it, it, this, this is not you, you, you. Neither of these formulas are going to do it for you. It's this righteous living, this relationship with God that that l living salvifically is. Yeah what brings salvation, right? It's kind of like saying you're going to fight with your wife and, and you've done something really horrible. And then you say, okay, so if I just do these things, are we good? You know, or, or if I just say, I'm sorry, right. If I just ask for forgiveness and I just say my sinner's prayer, then are we good? Like the last thing that someone who's been wrong wants to hear is what's, what's the formula that I can do to get right. Right. It's just, just, 
just get right with me again, you know, just be that loving person again. And then it'll all mm -hmm. the relationship work back out. But if you say like, so, so if I wash dishes, are then are we good? You know, or, you know, like, or if I, or if I, if I just say, sorry, then you forgive me, then are we good? Like, obviously mm -hmm. it doesn't just work formulaically like that mm -hmm. in either case. It's, it's about a real change, a real change of heart. It's real righteousness. It's real, yeah. it's, it's a real turning, a real walking that yeah. shows that you, 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 yeah. you know, you're sincere and you're doing it right. Right. It's about humility, about letting Yeshua mm -hmm. reign in one's heart through actions. Yep. Paul says in Philippians 2, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Right. And that's the humility. That's like, you know, all of kind of what it's a process. Sanctification. Yep.